Excited to be joined by former all SEC defensive lineman for your Ole Miss Rebels. It's Jesse Mitchell. Uh, Jesse, you played here at Ole Miss back in 2000 to 2003, redshirt year in 99. The further you get away from your career and just get to be a fan uh, of Ole Miss football or college football as a whole, what's your favorite thing about college football Saturdays? That feel, the feel. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, it's one of those things where you don't even have to be in the stadium. You can wake up at home on a Saturday when you know it's college football Saturday and the, the air even tastes different. Um, <laughs> I guess that goes back even to being a player. You just program that uh, it's showtime. It's a different day. Saturdays during the fall, during college football season means a whole different thing. And uh, that never leaves you. I think it's really interesting because you, you see the commercials on TV and uh, a lot of fans maybe don't get it, but you hear tales of college athletes. They're, they don't always go on to be Hall of Famers in the NFL. They become leaders in their communities. You're a shining example of that uh, with what you do in your law career here in the state and all you do when you're representing the University of Athletics on councils here for the University of Mississippi. For you, what did being a college athlete teach you about life uh, as you moved on to the second part of your career? Seth, everything. Uh, and it's why I actually... Uh, in my firms, I try to hire and recruit other athletes because here's what I know when you show me that you've been a college athlete or really an athlete at any high level. Number one, you're going to be disciplined. Number two, you're going to be open and susceptible to coaching and correction. Number three, you're self-motivated and driven. Uh, and you give me those three things. Intelligence um, is something that I think is, is overrated in a sense. Don't get me wrong. You have to have a certain degree, but if you give me those other three traits that are that I know consistently are born from athletes uh, that played at a high level, I'm I can guarantee you that you'll be successful. So those are things that I recruit and look for um, in my profession because those are things that I know absolutely that I was taught by my coaches and by that whole process of being a, a college athlete. Um, you got to do it. It's there. It's in you. It's if not. You don't make it to that level and you don't sustain at that level. It seems like something too for for you and even in your profession, like there's certain things from an experience standpoint that you can teach. But there's there are certain things that are innately learned behaviors and things that are just inside of you. And like you said, it doesn't always necessarily mean like you want the most intellectual person. You want someone that you know have these traits and that you can take and go kind of to the next the next level or take them to the next thing. And I think that's, uh, I think that's cool, but, you know, moving on a little bit. So in your, in your current role, what, what do you think was harder? So you have experience in two different areas, right? So there are a lot of different areas, but specifically on this question, harder to take on LSU and Baton Rouge with, with it rocking or law school, what was harder? Oh, law school without a doubt. <laughs> um, law school without a doubt. Um, Brandon, man, you know what? That's an interesting question because I always tell people, you know, you, you hear about home games, the, the home field advantage in that vibe. Man, I was that dude that loved to play on the road. Give yeah. me the most hostile environment, which was LSU because my brother was playing there. And, 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 and LSU, they're different. We all know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> people they, they have the most they have the most rowdy fans in in the SEC and probably in the country. I loved and I thrived up that environment. That fueled me. Um, so, law school, man, law school is a daily absolute grind. It is a war of attrition. It is um, you're on you're on your own, dropped off in the middle of the woods, and you got to figure it out. And every day, it's hard work and survival. Um, but the things that I learned in, in practicing and being in football and practicing in two a days, which is you want to quit at some point, there's going to be a breaking point, but mentally you got to push through and that's where success and the, the reward is. And so again, football translating into the business aspect as well as into law school really uh, paved the way and, and helped me create those disciplines that have sustained me. So what was it that made you kind of say, okay, I want to do law, right? So, you, you know, you obviously you come here, you, there's, you know, college, you can do anything, right? So what was it that kind of made you say, hey, I want to, I want to go into this profession or this field? Uh, easy, Brandon. Uh, 
so that I had two mentors when I was at Ole Miss, uh, which is Joy Langston and Dick Scruggs, who were two of the pioneers in the tobacco uh, litigation. Yeah. And um, man, I was able to be around them and be in their firms and see them work and operate and learn a lot. And I realized, and they helped me to realize I had some of the, the attributes that make a successful litigator. Um, and once I got around those guys and kind of saw the way they operated and was introduced to uh, litigation in the law world, I got a one track mind at that point. It became what, how do I get in law school? And that all, that came all the way down to the major I selected, which was accounting because it, it carried a heavy weight into law school admissions. So that was once, like I said, once I got around those guys in they believed in me and they they're the ones who first pointed out that I had the tools to be a good litigator. It was a one, I was a one track mind after that. So let's not forget about your playing career though. Six and one, you're six, one, 277. If I called you an undersized defensive lineman, what would your response be? That's what made me who I was. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to say. Uh, it, it absolutely did. And I, I tell you this, Brandon, now you look at, and don't get me wrong. They have some great, huge D linemen now, but let, let's talk about some of the greatest three techniques to ever play the position. John Randall, Warren Sapp, now Aaron Donald, right? right? Oh, yeah. These are all guys who, you know, I always say you look at the program, there's a little sugar added on six, four, that really means six, one. <laughs> Right, uh, uh, three hundred really probably means two seventy five. Right. Uh, so, but if you look at the guys who really have impacted that position as a three technique, Vince Wilford, they're not extremely tall guys. Man, I, I love playing against the six five, six six, six seven offensive line. I owned them all day. My toughest games came when we played Arkansas States. <laughs> and the guys look at me eyeball to eyeball. <laughs> right. Those guys are tough to move. So, yeah, I relish that title. And you you would hear some of the big guys at Alabama, um, some of the offensive linemen, man, you're small. And then after the game, they come and find me to shake my hand like, dude, you gave me all that I ever wanted. So, you know, I was in school your last year. I'd, I'd started at Ole Miss. And I always, I always thought, you know, I was always a big fan because I felt like you always played with this chip on your shoulder, right? This just, you know, people are going to say this and I'm going to read this and whatever. But it just seemed like you always played with that, just that little bit of extra edge. Was some of it because of those things or was it just that mentality of, you know, I'm, I'm going to work and I'm going to get this done? Man, it, it it's probably a combination of all three. But in, and I add this. It stemmed from being the little brother in a house of three boys. And my brother, my <laughs> middle brother being a high school All-American. Um, Dandy Dozen going on playing at LSU. I had big shoes to fill and and not reach. He would not let me not reach my full potential. He would not let me accept that I couldn't be the best. Um, so you couple that with. Everywhere you go, man, people, oh, man, that dude's a, a defensive tackle. That's Jesse Mitchell. That's every day, baby. I brought my lunch pill. And they <laughs> filled me. You had to improve my work. So, yeah, it was a combination of of the three. Um, and I always kind of like – I think Michael Jordan probably said it or showed it the best on the docuseries. Sometimes, man, you got to just find things to make personal. Right. You know, that goes back from, again, while I talked about hiring athletes, athletes, even in a professional world, they find ways to self-motivate. So I have a couple of moments of, you know, from when you played in those teams. For you, when you look back on it, is there a moment or a couple of moments where you immediately just pop into your head where you just have that feeling of nostalgia and you immediately say, you know, like, man, that was a cool – time you know moment of time what is that for you you know from your playing days what what is that moment for you or moments man it's it's several one I remember the first bus ride you're talking about Jamil Northcutt I remember the first time I met all those guys uh and everybody would sign that year we used to have real freshman tour days 
Um, recruiting was not like it is now. Now these kids know each other because of social media, right? They know each other extremely well. Back then, you never met half, if not 75% of the guys who signed with you until the day y'all met on campus for freshman tour days. So that moment, riding the bus, getting to know those guys. Also, um, when I was selected as team captain, I mean, that's, that, that was a, a position and a title that I held dear to me. Uh, leadership has always been something that uh, I prized, uh, as well as winning the Cotton Bowl. Now, also, let me give you a negative. When we lost to LSU, <laughs> when we lost to LSU, uh, and that kept us from, it had to split the SEC West title, but kept us from going on representing the West in, uh, in, in the SEC championship conference. What, one of my full favorite bowl memories for you was obviously the 2003 Nebraska game, the Independence Bowl. Uh, I've, I've seen you tell that story before about absolutely taking Richie Incognito's lunch. And uh, the thing that makes me happy as an Ohio Bobcat alum, that's kind of the start of the downfall of Frank Solich's time in Nebraska. So in a roundabout way, I have you and your teammates to thank for getting Frank the Tank to Athens, Ohio, and giving me some memorable college years myself, Jesse. <laughs> well, look, you have my address. Send me a check. <laughs> <laughs> you, couldn't get, you couldn't get them while you played. That's, all, no, that's I, can, I can get them now. Um, <laughs> man, yeah, that was uh, that was an amazing game. Uh, and actually, every time I see Richie Incognito or any time he's shown on TV, um, I start getting text messages from Ole Miss fans and people. Um, yeah, I own that dude, that game. Um, but that was another amazing game, man. We had, especially those guys coming in, they had a chip on their shoulder. We, they, they didn't think they, they were supposed to be in the same bowl game with us. And we took that, we took it personal. We took it personal. And I told my guys before that game, I said, they looked down on us. We went to a dinner, uh, uh, you know, a team dinner. With, they had both teams. And just the arrogance they had in the room rubbed me the wrong way. And so that night at the hotel, I told my guys, I said, they will understand who Ole Miss is. They will understand who we are, what we represent, and that we are better than them. And so an interesting story in that whole deal was sometimes coaches can overcoach and get caught in the moment. And um, we had that starting out with uh, Coach Drisback. He was calling and had us moving a lot. And I went up after the first, after the first two series, I got on the phone and I said, and I called my coach, Coach Petrie. Uh, and I said, listen, he in the box with Coach Drisbeck said, tell him, give us one series to let us play. Defense and let us play. And the rest was history. We whooped there. <laughs> no, that was a great game and all those teams to just the, there was like a two or three year period there where those teams just it seemed like every guy on the roster had a chip on their shoulder to a certain extent it wasn't it was a collective you know it was like a we all feel like we've been you know mistreated or misplaced or whatever and it was just it, it seemed really unique but moving into current times right so how do you feel like with the amount of mobile quarterbacks now, just it, it seems like D, D lineman can be the difference in a, in a really good defense in college now, as opposed to, you know, back in your day, everybody thought you had to have these big, you know, beefy guys, but your defensive line now and you, the way you play, I think would be more successful in these type defenses and offenses so how have you seen the game change since you guys played and and just kind of you know walk us through how you might dominate now more than you yeah, did yeah, yeah you're absolutely right uh Brandon the game has changed we were an undersized defensive line at that time just think I mean you had a bunch of isos that were still being run you had counter plays with lead blockers all the time so our linebackers you want it back then, a linebacker was 245, 250, a thumper, right? That could hold up. Now, linebackers are 225, 220. Right. Yeah. That, that's what Kevin Robinson was as a safety. 
Right, yeah. Um, and your defensive linemen have started to look different. The way they operate has started to look different. Uh, those guys have to be quick. They have to be nimble. They have to move. They're not mushers. They're not going to sit there and, you know, just hold up man to man. No, they want to penetrate That's what my game was. They want to pass rush. They want to be able to bottle up the quarterbacks and then also deal with the RPOs and the, and the, the instances when the quarterbacks uh, are on design runs. You got to have guys who can move. And so these guys are built differently. They're built, they're built for that. Um, offenses dictate that. This is offensive game now, especially with the rules that they play. Well, you seem to be keeping up with the game in its current form and, and the players that are currently on Ole Miss's team. They look to be much improved from seasons past. What are you seeing from this team as they are trying to assert themselves as one of the best defenses in the country? Yeah, man, I see some guys who are playing with chips on their shoulders. I, I, I see some guys who know and want to make a name for themselves. I see some guys who walk on the field and step across the line and, and truly believe that there's nobody else out in the country that can play with them. And that's what you have to have. Right. And I think that's what Coach Kiffin um, and his in the staff that he's put together have built is, you know, and it, it takes time as a new coach. You're inheriting players from an old program. You have a different style, different philosophy, different mindset. Um, but I think now you're seeing Coach Kiffin and his crew really put their stamp on what they want to be on both sides of the ball at Ole Miss. Right. They thought, okay, it's only offense. We're going to have to shoot out everybody. And Coach Kiffin said, no, I'm about to build a defense that can withstand and, and give us a break. And we're going to, when we do that, we can play with anybody in the country. And I think that's what he really has done. You can see it mentally lock in with these players. They're different. I see the jersey over your left shoulder. So uh, you know what good defense looks like the time you were uh, with some of those Baltimore Ravens. What did you learn during that uh, that stint that you had with, with Baltimore? Man, I learned uh, really three things. One, defense is the culture there, right? Now, it's you, you're seeing it with Lamar. He's, he's, he's really bigger than life. But when you walk into that whole program, defense is the culture there. Uh, number two was you saw two of the greatest to ever do it, Ed Reed and uh, Ray Lewis, two smartest individuals I've ever been around. The way they understood and broke down and could see the game before it was even played was amazing. And so you couple that with their athletic ability and you see why they were first ballot Hall of Famers. Right. right. Um, and then, man, third was just to see the way Ozzy had such Ozzy News has such an effect and respect uh, in, in the NFL period, not just in that organization, in that NFL period. Um, in in. And then some of the great players, man, I had the ability to learn from and play with, like Jonathan Ogden, who right. would be one of the smartest individuals I've ever run across, but also is was huge and was just a dominant force um, uh, on offensive line for him. Just, I mean, the amount of sheer greatness you've gotten to learn from and be around in your career when you talk about a guy who we're honoring this season and Eli Manning, uh, you got to see Patrick Willis as a young buck. What was it like being with, with some of these Ole Miss legends and, and knowing that you are a part of, of what made Ole Miss great during that time? Man, Seth, it's one of those things, you know, I still see Eli, I call him Nelson. That's his middle name. Um <laughs> Patrick, I was just with him uh, two weeks ago. Man, <clears throat> you know, the the legend that you guys see, it's totally different for us. Sure. Um, because, again, it, it, we all, as soon as we get together, we revert back to our playing days, right? We revert back to brothers being brothers. We revert back to not – we rarely talk about actual football games, what we talk about is the pranks and the fights that occurred or the funny things that occurred in the locker room. Uh, so it's, but to see those guys actually finally get the respect that they deserve 
for what they did on and off the field. It's amazing. Man, I was just blessed to be around a great group of guys throughout my time, you know, even before I came to Ole Miss to now. I've been really blessed to have some great people in my circle. Who are some of the guys that you still keep up with, like on a on a daily or weekly basis, like just kind oh, of in man. your circle? Yeah, so the guy who raised me, Terrence Metcalf. Uh, man, uh, he, he's definitely one. Patrick uh, is another one. Uh, Eli and I, we talk, but not – as coming in that or as often. Um, Goldie. Goldie, <laughs> yeah. Goldie and I talk daily. Von Hutchinson. Um man, it's so, it's so many because you know, it's it's one of those things where we may not talk every day, and it may go a month without us without us talking, but you it, we picked right back up where we uh, where we left off. Kevin Robinson is another one. Um, man, so so many. Uh, and then we have these group chats, which oh, <laughs> yeah. If I mean, you, you get can talk about some funny things that go on <laughs> in the group chats and how we get on each other. It's man, the camar- the camaraderie and just missing those guys. It's. Um, Tell you, it, it gives me chills right now just thinking about it and talking about it. That's awesome. So changing gears a little bit, tell us about your family. So I, I keep up with you on Facebook for the most part, and it looks like you're always uh, your family guy, which is which is just fits your personality perfectly. It's tell us about your family, your kids. I know you're involved with them because I see every weekend or every other day on the golf course or hunting or fishing yeah. and doing something. It just seems like you're you're trying to instill just the same kind of things that that are your personality into them, which I think yeah. is awesome. Man, I came from a, a a home. I think I was telling maybe Seth this. I can't remember, but I came from a house of three boys. Again, I was the youngest, and now I have three boys. Um, and my dad spent tons of time with us in outdoors, um, from hunting to fishing to football to baseball to basketball. You know, creating those moments with my boys, that's where I get my break. Um, Like I said, I'm all around the country trying cases, uh, but spending time with them and creating memories with them and doing the things that my dad did with me, as well as, you know, delving into new areas, new sports, new outings, new experiences, traveling is something that I make sure I give them and I do with them because, you know, the things that they will remember the most is the time that their dad spent with them, not what I gave them, not what I bought them, but actually the moments and the time that I spent with them. So that's important to me. That's awesome to hear, Bihad. Just uh, they just had their second child, so I'm sure he appreciates that as well too, right, Bihad? Absolutely, you're you're 100 right. It's it's ten ten times more fun to just spend time and just goofing off and doing nothing than it is me going and buying her a you know dollhouse yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in t- in ten minutes, that thing will be destroyed. <laughs> and, and actually, like, yeah, you you go and, that money. <laughs> yeah, you, you go and spend five hundred dollars on a, a doll house or or whatever, and then they'll play with the box. that's 100 percent accurate (laughs) well one of the best defensive linemen to do it for Ole Miss so much fun to watch and he's been a true joy chatting with here today we really appreciate you Jesse and thanks for all you do in the state for our university and and continue to do great work appreciate it so appreciate it Brandon absolutely thanks Thanks, Howdy, howdy man